Well, what a treat. Welcome, everyone. We're so thrilled to have you all here. And it's such an honor to share the stage with not only two of the most extraordinary women on the planet, but two of the leaders that I admire most. We're so glad to be able to do this. And I think the great place to start is that the two of you actually have a relationship. And Malala, I was curious about how you met and what your connection with Cheryl is. Uh, so I think, uh, first of all, thank you so much to all of you for such a warm welcome. And I'm really excited to talk today. Um, I met Cheryl, I think, in 2014, and it was in relation to, I think, our film, my film, He Named Me Malala, and we had a talk about that on Facebook Live, and then I went to Facebook office. We met lean-in uh, group members, and uh, we met Mark Zuckerberg as well. And as soon as I entered the room, my father said, oh, who's he? And then <laughs> my father is sitting right there. So then we say, oh, he's Mark Zuckerberg. And uh, it was a great event. And then we went to Cheryl's house. And it just, we started building up that family, that friendship. And we still have it. And we treasure it. And we are thankful for it. So I got to interview Malala on Facebook and then invite her and her father and her mother and her brothers uh, to my home for dinner. And they are um, one of those families that just seems so remarkable from afar. You can't imagine they could be even better up close, but they are. They are warm and loving and giving and have been a real source of friendship uh, for me and my children. I feel very lucky. So we're here to talk about option B tonight. And Cheryl, I'd love for you to just share with us what option B means in your life. So the name of the book that Adam and I wrote together uh, comes from something that happened just a few weeks after I lost my husband suddenly. I um, was talking to my friend Phil about a father-son activity we ha I had signed my son up for, and I needed someone to fill in. And we came up with an idea my brother-in-law, Rob, Dave's brother, to fill in. But I said to Phil, you know, I don't want that. I want, I want Dave. I want Dave to go do this with our son. And Phil said, well, option A is not available, so let's kick the out of option B. And what was powerful about what he said was that he didn't say, you're going to go live option B. He said, we. It was, we are going to kick the not cursing in the presence of, you know, but we are going to kick, kick, kick option B. And it was, it was that understanding that we all live some form of option B. I mean, sometimes it's true trauma where you lose your country and your life as you know it, like Malala has been through. Sometimes it's the kind of trauma of losing someone suddenly or not suddenly in your life. Sometimes it can be something small, but no one's life is exactly as they planned it. And at some level, we all live option B. Malala, you wrote something beautiful about the book. You were so kind to read it. And you said that none of us can escape sadness, loss, or life's disappointments. So the best option is to find our option B. Can you tell us what option B means to you and, and how you found it? So um, when I was attacked, I woke up in a, in a hospital in Birmingham. And all I remembered was that I was on my way uh, home from school and I was with my friends enjoying my time and suddenly I'm in this country, people are speaking English and I'm in this hospital and what has happened to me. Uh, and I realized that yes, I had been attacked and something had happened to me and that I was no longer with my family and my family was still in Pakistan. And it was a really difficult time. But for me, the most important thing at that time was patience and to stay calm and to be hopeful about my future and to know that everything will be good and then soon my family arrived and I got back together with my family and I started my life again in a sense. And it was, for me, it was like a new life. So uh, accepting myself after that attack, who I am, and being thankful for the family I have got, being thankful for all the friends I have, uh, to me was the best way to fight against what I had been through and that was my option B. It's amazing. I think, you know, when we think about resilience, when we started reading resilience research, it was actually done on people in the worst of circumstances, going through war and poverty and abuse. And it's amazing how widely this research applied. And Cheryl, that was one of the first things that we started talking about. And that theme of gratitude was really relevant to your life, life too. 
So after I lost Dave, just a few weeks later, Adam said to me one day, long before we were working on a book, he said, you should think about what could be worse. And I know that things can be worse. I haven't lived through what Malala's lived through. But you know, when your husband dies suddenly, no, few people say to you, you should think about what could be worse. Most people are trying to cheer you up. Sorry. And, and I would have thought if you're trying to escape from deep grief, if you're trying to get through, you know, what is the major overwhelming grief and sadness, you should think about positive thoughts. So I looked at Adam like he was, you know, absolutely not thinking at all. And he's one of the most brilliant people I ever met. And he said, no, I mean it. He said, Dave could have had that same cardiac arrhythmia driving your children. And it had never occurred to me. And absolutely, I could have lost all three of them in that same split second. And the minute he said it, I did, I felt better. I thought to myself, okay, my kids are alive, I'm okay. And counterintuitively, whenever we face something that's really hard, and it can be hard, and it can be overwhelming, thinking about what could be worse helps us find gratitude for that which we took it really for granted before. And one of the major lessons for me in building resilience, how we build it in ourselves and each other, is finding gratitude for even the most basic things, like the fact that my children were alive, something I never really thought to be grateful of, for, grateful for before. Malala, you've, you've had a huge impact on us in many ways, but one of them is um, actually teaching us how to practice, practice gratitude every day. And I wonder if you could just share with us how you found that sense of appreciation. Um, well, I think um, having a great family and uh, they, that kept me normal and I have two brothers that are younger than me and um, we are like normal brothers and sisters and we fight and we argue and, uh, and, I'm, and I was just, well, when I am in fight with them, I'm quite serious but then later on I think and I'm grateful that I have them because they remind me that I'm a normal sister and uh, they keep my life busy in those things. Uh, but also the support that I have received from people from all over the world, like the letters I have received, the cards I have received, the presents I have received, like from shampoo to a scarf, to everything, because people were worried about me that you are in a hospital and we need to take care of you. So I think uh, the love that you receive from people, whether they're your friends and family, I think that's the best thing you can ever have, and I'm just always grateful for that. And I think in return, you should show the same love and the same care for others, um, except my brothers. Uh, so, <laughs> and I think that's, that's the best way uh, to, to thank back. Well, no, no one ever sends me shampoo, but <laughs> um, I'm, I'm amazed that a Nobel Peace Prize winner still fights with her brother. And I think that's reassuring to all of us. You know, Adam, at my house, whenever we have dinner, we do our best, worst, and our grateful. And the last time Malala and her family were there, we were doing our best, worst, and, and grateful. Um, and we had this really amazing moment. So my friends Katie and Scott were there, and their son had just transferred to a new school. And Malala and her family got to meet them. And they had been talking to me all week about how they were worried about him in a new school. And then when we went around for that best, worst, and grateful, Scott said, talking to Malala and her life's work of making sure girls can go to school and everyone can get an education, he said, you know, in this moment, I'm grateful for the fact that my children have a school to go to. Right? For so many of us in the developed world, we take that completely for granted. I started my career working at the World Bank on the India health team, and there were a lot of people then, and there still are, who did not get to go to school. And we forget that. I mean, I know that. I worked there. But just thinking about the fact that, you know, my kids are lucky to go to school, as well as the daily struggles they face, is the, is the kind of gratitude we talk about with post-traumatic growth. So that, I think that's one of the biggest surprises that a lot of people experience when they go through hardship or adversity of any kind, is they come out feeling more grateful. And I'm curious to hear more about, about how we could all do that. Um, Cheryl, you've, you've talked about how there's post-traumatic growth, but you also have another phrase here. And I think this speaks to something that um, Julia Samuel here in the UK has written so eloquently about on grief. She says that pain is the agent of change. And I think that's, that's something that we can all relate to, but could you talk to us a little bit about what that means? Well, let me ask the audience, who here has heard of post-traumatic stress or PTSD? 
Everyone, and that's important because this is a very real problem and not one we deal with well enough. We need to do better. Who's heard of post-traumatic growth? Yeah, so you look at the difference. Now, again, post-traumatic stress is a really important problem that we need to do better dealing with. Many more people will experience post-traumatic growth than post-traumatic stress. And post-traumatic growth means that from the hardest things in our lives, we learn, we grow. Our lives become deeper, more meaningful. We find more purpose. We form deeper relationships. We, we form deeper relationships. We are more grateful. And you wouldn't want to go through that to find the post-traumatic growth at all. I would give all of the growth I've had back to give Dave back, to get Dave back. I don't want to have grown this way, but I have and we do. And that's a pretty incredible thing. There's an amazing group of people here with us today. I had a chance to meet with right before I came. I went to an, visit an organization called Drive Forward. They work with, uh, with young adults who are coming out of the care system, so care leavers. People are in what we call foster care, what you call care, until they're 18. And then they are young adults and they are on their own with no institutional or no, I'm sorry, government support. And that's pretty pretty hard place to be. There are 70,000 kids in the care system in the United Kingdom. 2,000 will come out every year in London alone. 40% of those young adults will wind up homeless within the first six months because they don't have the support they need. And so these amazing people I just had the chance to meet with told unbelievable stories of post-traumatic growth. One is a young man who said that he grew up with severe violence in his home, so severe that he had to leave and go into the care system by age six. And he said that he learned, even as a very young child, to kind of scan the room to see what was going on and understand the motives of the people around him. He went into the care system at six, went to university. He is now working as a mediator in Gaza. And he says that one of the reasons he thinks he's successful in his job is that he walks into a room and he understands people. He is reading people, looking for violence, looking for the people that will come to the table. The way he learned to and what was the truly traumatic situation of a childhood. And then another young woman who's also here shared a story of how she bears the scars on her body of the violence and trauma that she faced as a child. And that sometimes when she takes a shower and looks at her own body, she looks at those scars and thinks of what she's been through. But she's really taught herself to see those scars as the sign of resilience. And here's the most incredible part of the story. I asked them two hours ago when we were meeting in their office if I could share those stories. And they said yes, but then they said that they were worried that by sharing only two of the stories of this amazing group of people, it was somehow giving those two people more recognition than the others. So they were only comfortable with my sharing the stories if I found a way to recognize all of them. Unbelievable. So these young adults have come through unbelievable trauma, and they are not just building individual resilience, but they've formed a community that only wants to be recognized in the collective. And so it is like one of the big honors for me to ask these amazing young adults and Martha Waynesboro, who founded Drive Forward, to stand up and be recognized for the resilience they have and they share. One of the things Adam and I learned studying resilience for this book is that we don't just build it in ourselves, we build it in each other, and we build it in the collective. And it is organizations like Drive Forward that form communities like this that teach us what, what resilience is. So thank you to this group of people for teaching me and I think all of us so much today. We're going to talk more about communities. Um, I, want to, I want to actually zoom in on the growth theme a little bit, though. Um, Malala, you've talked about how special occasions are really important for finding growth and, and appreciating the things that you have in your life. And I thought your mother did something profound on your birthday. Can you talk to us about that? So um, since the attack on me, uh, whenever my birthday comes, which is the 12th of July, my mother, she writes a card to me and. Uh, she has been writing like happy first birthday and last year when I turned 19 she wrote to me happy fourth 
birthday of Malala because four years had been passed since the attack. So uh, to her, I am growing again after the attack and for her this is a completely new life of her daughter. So she is uh, very grateful, she really believes in prayers, she is a very, uh, she follows religion Islam very deeply and she prays for me every night, every morning and that is something that gives me strength every day when I come out of house, when I go out to events and everything, when I do my exams as well, uh, <laughs> to know that my mother is there, she's praying for me and that will keep me safe. So that is something that gives me strength every day. And Cheryl, you've, um, you've also had a lot of people in your life talk about the importance of birthdays in appreciation and resilience. And for me, so before I lost Dave, I really celebrated birthdays like the zeros and the fives. And you know, I work for someone who's 15 years younger than I am, so my best jokes are about being old, right? So raise your hand if you've joked about getting old. Okay, more of you raise your hands. You're lying. Go ahead. Let's be honest. I will never ever make another joke about growing old again, ever. A few months ago, my cousin turned 50, and I called her that morning, and I said, Laura, happy birthday. I'm calling to wish you a happy birthday, but I'm also calling in case you woke up with that, oh my God, I'm 50 thing today, because this is the year that Dave doesn't turn 50, and he never will. And it turns out that there's really only two paths. We either grow older or we don't, and so I will never joke about growing old again because it's a gift, and it's not one that I will take for granted again. Adam and I have talked a lot about post-traumatic growth. We believe in pre-traumatic growth, that people can have the growth without the trauma. I wish I could go back and live one day with Dave with the appreciation I would have for that day now, but I can't. But I can live today with the appreciation to be on the stage with these amazing people, to have Ariana and Isabella with me today, to have Gail, my amazing UK publisher and friend here. I can appreciate these moments, and so can all of you. Because even if you haven't been through the trauma, you can appreciate growing old in a way we might not have thought of before. One of the things that happens when you go through tragedy or adversity of any kind is, is sometimes your identity changes, and you have to realize I'm not the person that I was before. Um, and Malala, you said that acceptance was really critical. Um, who do you want to be today? Um, and I, I hope I never have to have you in my classroom because I would just make you teach the class. <laughs> but what, what do you, how do you want people to treat you in school and who do you want to be moving forward? Uh, well, I want everyone to treat me normal. Um, I'm really grateful that my head teacher, Dr. Weeks, is here from um, my school. Uh, thank you for coming. And uh, they have really kept me normal student. Um, I have friends and I have to work hard every day. If I don't do homework, they tell me off. And it is a very normal life for me at school. And I have been grateful for it because I went, because I was campaigning for education and it was a great time for me to uh, live as a student, to learn and to be in a classroom. So now I'm finishing my A-levels and I think it has been a wonderful time of my life, I have learned a lot, and I, I'm just so grateful that I completed my school, which many children would not be able to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Cheryl, when, when you started talking with people about who you had become, you noticed that there was silence a lot, and you wrote a whole Facebook post about that. What, what happened? After I lost Dave, it wasn't just the grief, it was actually an increasing feeling of isolation. You know, before, this happened, I would drop my kids off at school and everyone would say hi. You know, then I would go to work and Facebook's a very chatty, friendly place, everyone would talk. But after I lost Dave, not so much. People looked at me as if I was a ghost. And I know I'm not the only person who's been through something hard here, obviously. So many people, not just us on the stage, but so many people have. And all of these real uh, hardships in our lives, they actually usher this huge elephant into a room. Do you want to completely silence a room? Say you just got diagnosed with cancer. Silence. Say your father just went to jail. You just lost your job. You just lost your child. These are the moments when we need each other the most, but we talk the least. And I understand that because before I lost Dave, if someone in my life was going through something hard, I would say maybe one time, you know, I'm so sorry. 
But then I wouldn't bring it up again because I didn't want to remind them. Hmm. You know, it's been over two years. If you walk up to me and say, I'm so sorry for your loss, I don't think, damn, I forgot. <laughs> How could you remind me? <laughs> right? And I promise you're not going to remind the person you're sitting next to in your office that she has cancer. She knows. So that respectful silence we do, which sometimes is important, doesn't work as often as we think it should. And we're not there for each other in the moments we should be. The other thing I used to do, and I just didn't know better, is when someone was going through something hard and I did acknowledgement, I would try to be cheerful. You have cancer, I know you're going to get through it. Well, now I know that the voice in the person's head was probably, how do you know I'm going to get through it? You don't know that, and it's a denial of their situation. I don't say that anymore. What I say now is, I know you don't know what's going to happen, and neither do I. But you will not go through this alone. I will be with you. It's an acknowledgement that we don't have control that these things are happening. And one of the goals Adam and I had, writing option B, and I had working with Rachel Thomas, the president of my foundation, who's here forming the option B community, is to kick a lot of elephants out of a lot of rooms so that we can be there for each other when we need each other the most. Malala, your presence has that effect all around the world. Um, you go giving people opportunity, you also go to give them hope. What do you say to people who are suffering as you go and visit them? So I have visited many refugee camps through the Malala Fund work, and I have been to Nigeria where I met the girls who escaped from the abduction by Boko Haram. I met some of the parents who had lost their daughters. I went to Jordan and Lebanon, and I met so many families who were refugees and girls who were living in these refugee camps, but still dreaming that one day they would see peace. Um, and I went to Rwanda, I went to Kenya, and I met amazing and incredible girls. And uh, in one of these uh, camps, there were Burundi refugees, and uh, we were sitting in a, in a gathering of these refugee girls, and there were lots of people, and then these girls said that, now I only want to talk to the girls in, the crowd, um, in this gathering, and all the men should go out. So all the men went out, and they said, okay, Malala's father can stay. So they let my father stay, and they started sharing their stories. And one girl, she stood up and she shared how how she lost her home, how she had to go through all these conflicts in her country, Burundi, and how they have become refugees, but uh, worst of all, that how her friend uh, became victim of sexual violence, and that she herself became a mother. She gave birth to a child when she was still in school. A school girl had to go through all these sufferings. And when you hear these stories, but when you see this strength while they're sharing their stories, that encourages you, that empowers you. So what keeps me going is their stories, is their strength, and they're standing up. They're not losing hope. They said that they want to get education, that they want to bring change in their, in their community, that they are going to be resilient, they're going to, that they are going to stand against any harm that they're facing in society. So I think that is what is keeping me strong, but also that whole community strong. And I think that's the most powerful thing that I hear from these people who I meet. It's yeah. amazing. But one thing that's so important about this work, and Malala and I have had a chance to talk about it privately, but I've also watched it on a public stage, is that so often you are giving voice. When those girls were abducted, you were one of the first voices calling for them. And it's, it's another form of another very large elephant on the global stage where girls get abducted, girls don't get education, girls face violence, people of all faiths face violence, and often those people have the least ability to speak up for themselves. So your ability and your dedication, even while you're in school, to giving those people voice, I think is a form of building resilience into our world. And I know how grateful I am for it and how grateful I think everyone here is for it. I have to say, there's something that I'm not grateful for, which is we've all written books, and if you walk into a bookstore, you'll notice that there's a huge self-help section. And those of you who spend time in America know that's basically the entire bookstore. <laughs> um, it's better here in London, but I would love to see bookstores create a help others section. 
And I think that that's so much of building resilience is knowing not just how we get through our own hardships, but also how do we show up for others? How can we be there to support other people who are suffering? And I would, be, I would just love to hear from both of you about what we can all do to be better family members, better friends, better colleagues, and really support the people we care about in our lives who are struggling. I think uh, there are so many ways, and I think there is no uh, one like mathematical answer. Um, the first thing is to talk to people is to know them, is to talk to them, is to share their, to listen to their stories and share your stories. And I think this is how you realize that you have the same stories and uh, you all have the same feelings and you are there to support each other, to help each other. And, uh, and I think this is something that makes you feel like you're not the only one and there are people there who care about you and who support you. So I think talking to people and supporting people is just so important, but, um, and also being, uh, you yourself have to be stronger as well to know that hardships come in everyone's life. And it is, in a sense, a test for us to show our patience, to show our courage, to show our strength, and to show that we can go through any hurdle in our life. It would take time. We need to be patient. And that one day we will see the sun, things will be OK, things will be better. And I think that's how I thought. Like, if when I remember myself, look back, to how I was after the attack, that when I would talk, I would talk really slowly. Uh, I would forget words. I would, um, I would struggle to remember people's names. My own doctor, like after one month, I asked like, oh, what's your name? My own friend, school friend, I had been friend with her for months and then I asked her like, oh, what's your name? And then, so I had been forgetting things. It was, it was really taking me time to develop my speech and memory because when the left side of your brain is attacked, it affects your memory. And um, so it was a hard time when I look back now. But then when I was living that time, when I was living that moment, to me, I, was, I just felt normal. I thought I was OK. I felt strong. And I think that's the thing. In whichever, in whichever situation you are, feel the strongest, feel the bravest, and know that you are at the best of what you could be. And, and things will get better. And that's how I lived all these years of my life that I thought things will be better. One day, everything will be OK. And, um, and I just stayed positive. Yeah. One of the lessons you get from the researchers who study resilience is the importance of rejecting permanence. Rejecting permanence. So when things are truly awful, Right? You're not going to be in the hospital forever. You're going to regain your memory. You know, for people who, when you have a death, and I know so many people in the audience have, it doesn't go away, and everyone grieves in their own time in their own way. But I sit here knowing that my worst of my days now are better than the best of my days right afterwards. Because time doesn't heal everything. Time doesn't heal completely, but time does heal. Adam and I have talked a lot about how we want the self, you know, the help others section of bookstores. And one of the things I learned was the importance of doing something specific. So one of the other think, mistakes that I used to make is that when someone was going through something hard in my life, I would offer to, you know, is there anything I can do? That's a very common thing to say, is there anything I can do? And I meant it kindly. But the problem was when I was on the other side of that question, I didn't really know how to answer well, can you make Father's Day go away so I don't have to live through it? And that question kind of shifts the burden to the person who's in need to answer the question. And so rather than offer to do anything, do something, even if it's imperfect. My friend, my dear friend Dan and Esther Levy, they lost a child very tragically, and they were in the hospital in California for months. And one of his friends texted and from the lobby of the hospital and said she was downstairs in the, hosp the hospital lobby for a hug for the next hour, whether he came down or not. She just showed up. And then a friend of mine read that story in our book. And she had a friend, not a close friend, who went to the hospital with her daughter, her four-year-old daughter had leukemia. And she said before she read the story in option B, she never would have invaded their space and shown up at a hospital. It's not her best friend. Who is she to show up? But she read the story in the book, so she went to the toy store, she bought a stuffed giraffe, she went to the lobby of the hospital, she texted, I'm here with a toy, I could just send it up. And the woman right away said, please come up. So she went upstairs, 
and the four-year-old opened the toy and the mother is standing behind her just crying, mouthing the words, thank you for being here. And the whole hour she was there, no one else came. I think we're too often afraid to say the wrong thing, or at least I was, so we don't say anything. We're too often afraid to do the wrong thing, so we ask open-ended questions, what can I do and don't do anything, show up. Show up, text someone from the lobby of a hospital, and it doesn't have to be your best friend from the first grade because we don't have enough of those. And show up, and I think this will make just an enormous difference. And one of the nicest things about writing this book has been the stories that are pouring in both on the Option B community on Facebook, but also just in the reviews and the letters to me and Adam about all the ways people are showing up more. And I'm so grateful to my friends who showed up because I learned this you know, from my, you know, Ariana kept trying to visit me after Dave died and I kept saying no. And a few weeks in, she showed up and said, I'm here with my suitcase. And it was the thing I needed. I needed her so badly, but I didn't know how to invite her into this house that was just a lot of crying all the time. And she showed up and helped carry me. And I think we can do a better job doing that for each other. That does mean, though, that... Yeah. I think one of the wrinkles there is that we have to be willing to accept the help that other people offer. And I'm just going to say to everybody in this room, Cheryl is the worst person ex at accepting help that I know. Um, she's used to being the giver in every relationship. And I remember um, she would call uh, like a few weeks after Dave passed away to talk, and she would open the call by saying, I'm sorry, not even hello. And at first I was like, who is this? And then I realized that that's the Cheryl Sandberg greeting is I'm sorry. And... Uh, <laughs> Eventually, I just said, look, you have to stop saying you're sorry, because if you do not let your friends be there for you, then you're not going to recover, and that means your kids will not recover. And so I banned the word sorry, and Cheryl calls the next day, and she says, I apologize. <laughs> no, that doesn't count either. But I think that it's so hard for many of us to accept help, because it feels like a sign of weakness, even though it actually becomes a source of strength. Malala, can you talk to us at all about, about how you come to terms with allowing other people to help you and support you? Um, I'm, like, I'm not sure about the culture here, but in Pakistan, if something happens in your house, you really expect everyone to come to your house and be with you and support you. If they don't come up, you it's might. Nice. Bravo. <laughs> Woo! So I think it depends on the culture as well. So I'm like really grateful of this culture of, in Pakistan that you have to be there, you have to give support, and it is just a social responsibility that you have. That if this, you wouldn't even know the person, but it would, they would say, oh, I'm so, and your brothers and sisters and their friend and something, and they would just come. And they would say, oh, I just belong to your village, and they would come. So this idea of being with people, being there to celebrate their joy, and then being there to be with them, to cry with them in their grief, is, is very important in our culture. So our, we, in a sense, were expecting people to come to us and be with us. And, uh, and I just really was grateful that people uh, came to me, supported me, and stood up with me. And, um, and I think that's what made me feel like, because once people start coming to you, once they start talking to you, things feel a bit normal. Your mind starts focusing on different things. Uh, but if you are just all on your own, then your mind is focused on that one tragedy and that one incident. And it's not just about tragedies, it's about everything in life. Like for example, my exams right now. And I am just like for these past days, I have I've just been thinking about my papers, how I have done. I think I did that question wrong, and I think I should have written this instead of that, and things like this. And I've been thinking a lot uh, to the extent that I have these spots on my face because of stress, um, <laughs> which I, I just didn't want to develop for this event, but I just couldn't control because it's stress. Uh, but then I realized that you just can't control it. It is a stressful time and you have to accept it and you have to go through it. And I think that's the thing that you have to, uh, you have to accept these things and then try to talk to people. So I talk to my friends and they say, yeah, it's stressful. And then we all enjoy because we all think it was stressful and the papers were hard. So I think just talking to people and sharing whatever feelings you have makes it a bit easier. <laughs> And meanwhile, your professors are terrified that they'll be the ones to give you imperfect marks. <laughs> I don't want to be the one who did that, but 
Um, I think that as, as we talk about hardship, you know, a lot of the, the challenges we face are not just individual, they are collective sometimes. It might be all of us being worried about an exam together. Um, but here in London um, and in the UK more broadly, there have been several terrorist attacks recently, two in London, one in Manchester. And I, I'm wondering what we can do to build collective resilience and as a community become stronger when we do face these horrible things as a group. I think the thing that the terrorists would like is uh, no harmony, impatience, people getting angry, people targeting each other, people blaming each other. So if, that thing, if those things are happening, then in a sense, that's what the terrorists want and they're succeeding. So the most important thing is that we stay united, that we believe in harmony, we believe in patience, that we believe in brotherhood, we believe in sisterhood, that we live together, and we know that if we stay together, we are going to be stronger than ever. And, uh, and this is how we can, we can fight against those extremist ideas, that you cannot defeat us, you cannot defeat this idea of democracy, you cannot defeat this idea of freedom, you cannot defeat this idea of living together. And, and I think that's the best way uh, to show support towards each other. And I think um, sometimes like if there's an attack and unfortunately they have, they say that they're fighting for Islam and then there's another attack and then they're from belonging to a different religion. I think reaching to conclusions through these things is, um, is not the right way to, to make a, uh, a perception about a religion or a faith or a group of people, I think the best thing is to go and visit them and to go and talk to them. That's something my father always says that rather than judging Muslims based on what you hear on the news, go and visit your Muslim neighbor next door. Talk to them, hear from them, and you realize that they're just like you. They have the same feelings, the same emotions, they have family, they have children, they're doing jobs, they're living a normal life, and I think that's how you know people when you meet them. Uh, meeting people through a television or social media wouldn't really work. So you need to meet them. I, um, I so agree with what Malala just said about not giving in to anger. One of the best Facebook posts I ever read, and I've read a lot of Facebook posts, <laughs> came from a man named Antoine Liris. He's a journalist in France and his wife was killed in a terrorist attack in 2015. Two, two days, I think, two days after the attack, two days, he went on Facebook and he wrote, two days ago, terrorists took the love of my life, the mother of my 18-year-old son, 18-month-old son, but they will not have my hate. I will defy them by not giving in to hate. My son and I will play every day. And we will defy them by playing and by living and by growing up in peace. And I do think with the fear, with people living all over the world and the fear of violence with these war-torn regions, more refugees than any time since World War II, I believe more now, it is so easy for people to give in to fear, to start distrusting people of different backgrounds. And if we do that, they win. And Antoine Liris's message of, I will not give in, and, you know, Malala, incredibly, has been the same thing. You've been asked, what would you do if met your attackers? And you've had, you've had a beautiful okay. answer. Well, I have been thinking about it since I was in Swat Valley. And every day when I would go to school, I would say, like, if an attack happened to me, what would I say if these people came? And I would always say that I would just tell them, like, before shooting me, please know that. I stand for peace and I want your children to go to school as well and that I will forgive them and I have forgiven them because this is hatred and anger is never a solution and it is never the best way you should have love in your heart and I think that is the best way for them and the best way for you as well. Incredible. You've both spoken about joy and the importance of finding joy even after we go through terrible things. Um, why is that so important and, and how do we find it? Cheryl, start with you. I think the first time I felt happy um, after Dave died absolutely took me by surprise. I went to a, a friend's bar mitzvah. Hit their child and a childhood friend put me on the dance, took me on the dance floor and I danced to this old song and it was about four months after Dave, I lost Dave and all of a sudden I just kind of broke down and had to be like taken outside. It was super embarrassing. 
And I didn't know exactly what was wrong, and then I realized what was wrong, because it felt different. I realized I felt okay for like one minute on a dance floor, and then I thought to myself, what am I doing on a dance floor when Dave is gone? Like, how dare I be dancing? And right around then, my brother-in-law, Rob, did something super generous, which he called me, and he said, all Dave ever wanted was for you and your children to be happy. Don't take that away from him in death. And what I learned working with Adam on this book is that joy is something we can't take for granted and often we have to work on and something we do not understand. I think we often think happiness is going to be found in the big stuff. Finishing our exams, which I know will be happy. I'm not trying to take that away from you. <laughs> Having a baby, getting married, finding a job, those big moments. And those are happy too, but happiness is the little stuff that happens every day in our lives and how we appreciate it. So probably the best suggestion that's ever been made to me in my life, Adam made to me after Dave died, which we make to all of you today, which is write down three moments of joy at the end of the day. So I now have a little blue notebook by my bed and I write down three moments of joy at the end of every day. And what I realized is that before this, I went to bed every night worried about what I did wrong, every night, and worrying about what would go wrong the next day, my next exam, my next thing at work, whatever it was. But because I'm gonna write down three moments of joy, and they can be small things, you know, my coffee tasted good. My daughter gave me a hug without being asked, hinted at, but not directly asked. <laughs> I pay attention to those moments. They become more my focus, both in the moment and at the end of the day. So no matter what you're going through, there are three moments of joy. Write them down. I think it's changed my life. Malala, what brings you joy? And, and do you have to work at it, or does it come naturally? I think um, I had noticed that sometimes we consider happiness and joy a very special moment and that there's a lot of excitement and, for example, like a party or you go on a trip and there's something happening. And then now I have realized that as long as like, there is nothing tragic happening, <laughs> there is joy. And as long as there's nothing really scary, there is joy, there is happiness. And I take normal moments of my everyday as happiness and as joy, like sitting on the table, having breakfast in the, in the morning. I just feel grateful that I, have, I see all my family members together and that we all are together, we are happy. So we do argue, my brothers and me, on the table, but still like I'm happy and I'm grateful. And then I come, I go to school, and I'm grateful that, yes, I can go to school, and I'm enjoying, and I'm learning. Though there's a stress of exam, there are tests, there is homework, then I come home, and then I'm with my parents, we eat, we, we talk, we watch TV, we go out, things like that. And I think all these things are happy moments, and sometimes we want, we want to define happiness as something really bigger, but I think uh, what you have right now this is the happy moment, this is the joy which you should appreciate, which you, which you should be thankful for, and I just don't expect anything bigger to be my happiness. I take whatever I have as my happiness and just am thankful for this. I have to ask one follow-up on that, Malala, which is your father is the most joyful person I've ever met. That's he has true. the biggest smile, the most contagious enthusiasm. Is there anything you've learned from him about, about finding joy? I think he has always stayed positive. Like when we were in Swat Valley, my father was running a school. And um, school is kind of, it was a private school, so it was for profit. Uh, but my father was always in kind of debt. We never really had a, enough profit. Uh, but his aim was to run the school and to help the children. And he was so enthusiastic. He would make sure like the parents were involved, the teachers were in involved. And I was studying in his school. Obviously, if he sent me to another school, then uh, people would say, your own daughter is not studying in your school. So uh, I had to study in his school. And mm -hmm. I just really enjoyed my time because it was a school where he encouraged girls to speak up, to believe in themselves. And that was the most beautiful thing because he believed in me when I was very little. And he believes in, in my brother. He believed in every child. 
I think that's the most important thing that you can do for a child is that you believe in them. You tell them that their views are important. When they are talking, you listen to them. You give them attention. And the moment you give them attention, that you look at them, they realize, yes, their views matter and what they're saying matters. And since my father did these things, that he listened to me, that he gave me attention, I started realizing that I have an opinion that it matters and that people should listen to it. And that just because I'm a child doesn't matter that I can't have opinion now. So that was one of the most important things, but also that he allowed me to speak out, which many parents did not do, but that he is also a happy person, a positive person, that he is, um, he looks forward and he uh, celebrates what he has and he works hard and I've never really seen him like complaining about things and like complaining we don't have this and complaining about like, it's, it's just always positive. So he has made us positive as well. I think, I think Malala's father is an example, not just of, of joy, but also of, of not letting elephants come into him. I remember the first time you all came over for dinner after um, Dave had died. And, you know, even in my own home, a lot of people were afraid to mention it. And we, we do the Jewish prayer for bread before we eat. And so nicely, your father said, may I say a word? And then he did a prayer for me and my children with my children there. And it was so beautiful and so heartfelt and showed us that he, he said, I feel your sorrow as my own. When you lost Dave, we all lost someone and we are here in your home feeling his absence and wishing hope and joy for you. And it was such a beautiful example of addressing an elephant in the room and making people feel truly connected. And I know that Malala's ability to connect so many people uh, comes from her and also from such a great example. He, he's all of our father now. One of the things I find most inspiring about both of you is you not only find joy helping others, but you've also taught me that you build resilience through helping others, that you know, it doesn't just make you happy, it actually gives you strength. Um, and I think that you know, it's, it's amazing that you come from such different walks of life and such different worlds, um, you know, culturally, geographically, religiously, and yet you share this common passion for helping women and girls advance. And I wanna talk a little bit about what we can do to build a world that's more fair and more equal because we are very far from that today. And Malala, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, what can we do to give girls real opportunity and what have you learned through your work with the Malala Fund to give every girl access to education? I think there is a lot to do and uh, whether that's on the government policy level to what we as individuals can do. And I think the first and the most important thing is to know that we have a responsibility to contribute to the society. And that's what I have been feeling like, that I, I feel that I have a responsibility to contribute to this world in any way I can to make sure that girls get education, that I can help as many people as I can, uh, that if I was in that situation, I would have wanted people to help me. When we were in Swat Valley, I wanted the world to stand up and speak about the education of girls in Swat. I wanted people to speak about what was happening there when more than 400 schools were destroyed, when girls' education was banned. I wanted someone to speak out for me. I wanted someone to do something. So I think it is sharing that responsibility that we have to do something. And I think making sure that we, held, uh, we hold our governments responsible, that we keep on reminding them that they need to invest more in education, that they need to more invest in what benefits society, what is good for the society. And also to, to do and to contribute from our side, whether, uh, whether that's believing in education, that you invest in education, NGOs or funds or whether you help someone in your community who doesn't have enough resources um, and unfortunately poverty is all across the world it's not just in the developing world but even in the UK in the US so helping as many people as you can whether that is through raising your voice through supporting them through your donations whether that is joining a campaign anything you do really matters even if it's just giving a smile that is a lot to many people. And Cheryl, you, you started your career working on girls' education at the World Bank. What do you think needs to change in order to educate girls all around the world? Well, all over the world. 
uh, but particularly in, in some parts of the developing world, girls are just not invested in the way boys are, and they're not expected to have the same opportunities uh, boys are. And there are deep uh, reasons for all of this, none of which are acceptable. It's completely unacceptable that a young girl is not given the same health care as a young boy that the rate of mortality for under five for female babies is so much higher in some parts of the world than for boys. It's unacceptable that, you know, that there are families in which girls get ac boys get access to health care, boys get access to education. And it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure we change that. And that does not mean we think everyone should have the same culture and everyone has to have the same values across the board in every way. That's not what this is. This is about valuing every human life. This is about valuing every young girl the way we value every young boy and making sure that there's access to healthcare, opportunity, education. There's also an increasing uh, focus in many parts of the world on not just providing education, but the quality of that education. So there are countries that have done a, a better job of getting girls into school and boys in some of the poor areas, but they're not yet getting educated. My, my economist friend, Lant Pritchett, has written a very important book on not just providing education, but providing the quality of education where students can learn. And everyone has dreams and everyone deserves an opportunity to make the most of their lives. And without an education, we can't do that. And I think we all have the responsibility to support the work that Malala and others are doing and know that these global problems, these are our problems too. Malala, what can we all do to help? I know there are a lot of people in the audience who really want to see education and opportunity created for girls. What, what can we all do? Uh, so I, I was once one of those girls who could not go to school. And I woke up that morning, it was 2009, when I cried the whole day because I told my father that I wanted to become a doctor and now it is not possible because I can't go to school. And I said that I'll go work all that I'll work hard, I'll do all my best to get my education, but now I'm in a different position to which I can help many more girls. And it's not just about one Malala, but it's about all Malalas all around the world who, who want education, but uh, they need your support, they need your help. And I think um, the best way is we can help all those girls is to give them the opportunity to go to school. That is the way we can empower them. So through the Malala Fund, we, can, uh, we do th uh, three things. The first one is advocacy, that is campaigning for 12 years of quality education, where I met world leaders and speak about uh, every child's right to achieve complete and quality education. And then uh, secondly, we do investment. So that is investment in projects. We supported the girls who escaped from the abduction uh, by Boko Haram, and we gave them scholarships, and uh, they would be graduating this year. We also supported girls in, uh, uh, in Jordan and Lebanon, the Syrian refugee girls, and uh, we built a school in Lebanon on my 18th birthday. We also did projects in, uh, in Pakistan, uh, in Afghanistan, and we have uh, created Gulmakai Network, which is, um, with the idea basically come from my blogging. When I was blogging for BBC during that hard time in Swat Valley, I used the pen name Gul Makai. So since then, I have been thinking about all other campaigners, activists who are locally working in their communities who need support, as we needed support in our community. So our goal is to support them, is to empower those local champions. So that is our also another investment that we are doing, Gul Makai Network, we are establishing. Uh, in Pakistan, and we all currently have 10 champions right now. And then the, the third one is amplifying young girls' voices. We want to create young girl advocates. I have many friends from Nigeria, from Syria, Mozun, she's now in the UK as a refugee, and she's speaking out for herself. And I think this is some, that is the people we want to find out from those places who want to speak out but who need a platform. It's through the Malala Fund we give them platforms so that they can raise their voice and speak out for their community. So I think the way in which you can help is visit Malala Fund page, uh, see the ways through which you can help, whether that is through donation or screening of the film, He Named Me Malala, or many other ways. And whichever way through which you help really matters, and it would, be, it would just mean a lot to us and to all those girls who you would be helping. Uh, but also, I think when it comes to helping, the thing we all need is intention and is that one step we need to take is just stand up and do it. 
And I think we need that. We need that right now, not just for supporting girls' education, but for bringing that peace and for bringing that, um, that harmony in society, that we need to step forward, we need to say something. If we stay quiet, the bad things are going to be dominant. They're going to prevail. They're going to be, uh, they're going to be appearing. So the thing is that the good people need to stand out, the good people need to speak out, whether that's on social media, whether that is through coming out on streets and protesting, whether that is through supporting different works and different NGOs, all these things really matter. So the good people, the people who care about society need to speak out. We can't be silent. It is not that time anymore. No question it needs to start with girls, with education, empowerment, building confidence, creating opportunity. One of the things we've learned in the, the developed world is that now we have a lot of countries where girls are outperforming boys in schools, and yet they still don't have equal access to leadership opportunities. And Cheryl, this has been a huge focus of your work with Lean In. What is it going to take to get more women leading? So I don't want to disappoint everyone or shock you, but it turns out that men still run the world. What? And I'm not sure it's going that well. <laughs> About 30 years ago in developed countries, the United States, the UK, lots of countries, women, more women started graduating from university than men. So it's been over 30 years. And for, for many decades, Women's progress was steadily increasing in terms of getting the top leadership roles in every industry, nonprofits, for profits, companies, government. And then about 12 years ago, that progress basically stopped. 11 women run countries. There are women have 5% of what is the Fortune 500 CEO jobs in the United States, and the equivalent in this country and almost every country in the world 5%. And so we know something is going on because they're getting equal education, but they're not getting to leadership roles. So I want to ask a question, men only in this audience, please. Raise your hand if anyone called you bossy as a little boy. Women, raise your hand if you were called bossy as a little girl. So why is that? We know that boys are as aggressive or more when we do gender-blind studies of play and women in the, work, in the workplace, but we don't expect that. So this is, a cultural, this is a cultural stereotype that men should lead and women should be communal, and this is true all over the world. This is one culture we all share, no matter where you're from, country, religion, everyone believes that. But we can change it. So this weekend, go to a playground, find a little girl, wait five minutes for her to be called bossy, probably by her parents, walk right up to them and say, that little girl is not bossy. That little girl has executive leadership skills. <laughs> Bravo. I'm going to pause, and in Silicon Valley language, I'm going to double click on that. I'm going to try that the other way. Ready? That little boy has executive leadership skills. No laughter. I can and have replicated exactly that response in audiences all over the world for five years. That's because a girl having executive leadership skills goes so against our expectations that it's funny. Humor is because it surprises us. That's the problem. And that's the one we strive to fix. I think there must be some women here who are in lean in circles. There have to be, stand up, stand up, stand up. Stand up. Rachel, you're in a lean-in circle. Stand up if you're in a lean-in circle. So uh, my foundation, when we published Lean In, we started circles all over. These incredible women are meeting together once a month to lean in together, to give themselves a place to be ambitious. We were hoping for 1,000 lean-in circles. We now have 33,000 everywhere in all over the world in 150 countries. And I got a chance to meet with some of them yesterday. And what we know is that when women give themselves a place to be explicitly ambitious, it works. These women are getting raises, encouraging other women, aiming higher for things they want in their lives, whatever their ambitions are than we were before. And so thank you all so much because you inspire me. But whether it's in the form of circle, whether it's in the form of encouragement, we need to start encouraging girls to lead. 
and we need to start young and we need to make it constant. Thank you guys. So we're going to open it up to audience questions in just a moment, and there will be microphones available in the aisles, both on the main floor and as well as upstairs. While people are, if you have a question, feel free to come up um, into the microphone line. While people are gathering together, I have to say, when I was asked to moderate this event, I said, no, I, I just want to hear a conversation between the two of you. And I want to just give you a brief chance to have that conversation <laughs> and each ask each other one question that you would most like to hear the other answer. Well, we get to do that. <laughs> I think you go first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll think about it. You've always been so hopeful. Since I've met you, you, you always represent hope, and you do it publicly, and you also do it privately. Um, and I know we both, we both also have our moments of feeling that the um, obstacles for girls and women around the world are hard. Mm-hmm. In the really hard moments, where does your hope come from? I think there are a number of things that give me hope. Uh, I, I used to watch Bollywood films uh, when I was young. And in, in those films, like they're usually for three hours. For me, that's fine. But if you say to a person from the UK, that's just too long. Uh, but three hours is fine. And in those films, there would be a good life starting in the beginning. There would be a boy liking a girl and things would be going well. And then the villain would come and just ruin everything, but then the hero would go back and defeat the villain and things would be fine again. And that was happy ending. So I always believed in happy ending. And that's how I used to look at my own story that even if things are harder, whatever was happening in Swat Valley, then how I went through the incident, I was hoping for a happy ending in my story. And I think that's something that has always given me hope that things will get better, things will go positive. And if we just look back at history, how things have gotten better, like for example, the the rights of women to vote and suffrage, those things have improved. There's, we see, if we compare things, we see things have improved. We see uh, more equality, not, not reached to the extent we want, but still we see progress. And I think that things give me hope that things will get better but also my family and the people who I am around who support me, uh, that just gives me hope. And I think it's just pointless to be hopeless because there's nothing that you can get. All you do is just harm yourself, is just disappoint yourself more, and you just achieve nothing. So it's good to be hopeful, it's good to be positive. At least you enjoy your present. Uh, and at least you enjoy some moments of your life. Uh, if you are hopeless, you waste your present, and you're kind of also wasting your future. Mm. Oh, question. Uh, <laughs> I just never thought I would be asking you a question. <laughs> but I think... Um, How do you see um, the role of mother, not just mother, but as father as well? Because my father was not just father to me, but also mother. And I see my mother not just mother, but father. And I think it's just the idea of parenthood that is important. So how do you see yourself as mother, but also as father to your children? Well, I've thought a lot about this because I, you know, my my children don't have a father anymore. Um, And I think... You know, as parents, we just want the best for our children. And sometimes I try to think, what would Dave say? What would he do? And sometimes I have the answer and sometimes I don't. And then I just try to do the best I can. I do think that we have to do a better job raising our boys and our girls to both be leaders and both be givers. From young, young ages, we tell little boys not to cry. Man up. We tell little girls not to lead, you're too bossy. And so these messages that give these stereotypical roles in these homes, which are really outdated in a lot of the world and should be outdated in the rest of the world, continue. And it's really amazing they do these studies. In the United States, by the age of 14, if a girl sees her father doing chores, washing dishes, doing laundry, doing housework with the mother, she has broader career ambitions 
than girls that don't. So no matter how often you say to your daughter, you can do anything dear, she needs to see equality. And so I think that means that when our fathers are active fathers, when our mothers show leadership and our fathers show leadership and our mothers are active mothers, that starts to break down the stereotypes that I think are holding back the world because they're keeping men in power. We would love to take some audience questions now. Um, I know there are a lot of people here who have who've gone through hardship in some way, and if you do have a, a story that you want to share, um, you can go to optionb.org, and we build community around people exchanging experiences. Um, we want to keep the questions focused today on building resilience, on supporting women and girls. And in the US, we always like to remind people that questions end in a question mark. <laughs> um, here, we don't need to do that because in London, even statements end in a question mark. Uh, but if you have a question for Malala or Cheryl or both, uh, we would be thrilled to take it. Cheryl, this is a question for you. I am an avid reader of Lean In, and it has changed my mindset. And wanted to ask you, um, first of all, to say how sorry I am to have heard the news, and you seem to have been... I suppose in the last four years, I've seen a lot of uh, videos that you've, you've been in and also in your recent BBC interview talking about your life now as a single woman. Can you tell us a little bit more about how professionally you've managed to deal with not having a partner as a single lady? Because you used to talk in um, Lean In about how as a strong woman and you had your partner and before that um, your ex-husband and how it was in a way, a, a very important part of your life to have that person. How do you deal with it now? I'm so sorry to ask you a difficult question, but I'm interested no, to know. It's an important question. You know, when I wrote Lean In, I certainly wrote about and thought about different forms of family and talked about the poverty single mothers were living in. But I also wrote an entire chapter called Make Your Partner a Real Partner. And what I realized is that that title chapter had the same problem as the father-daughter dance does at my daughter's school that I cannot get rid of. There are kids without fathers. So do they have to call it that, right? Why can't they call it the you know, daughter-friend dance or something so everyone could bring someone? And similarly, did I have to call my chapter Make Your Partner a Real Partner, which has this assumption that everyone has one. And I apologize publicly for it. I did a post. Uh, a year ago on Mother's Day. And what I realized again is that there are so many different forms of family, but particularly families struggling. Losing a spouse pushes a lot of women into really abject poverty all over the world. Some of the customs for widows around the world are truly horrific, absolutely horrific. But even in the most developed nations, Losing a spouse pushes people into poverty as not having a spouse. And we just need to do better. And that's public policy, corporate policy, and the way we support each other. Something I've thought about a lot, and I thank you for asking me about. We're going upstairs. Good evening, and thank you for your inspiring stories. I have a question with a question mark, I promise. Um, you received great advice that to remind yourself of what could be worse. But when you've lived through something directly or indirectly, um, how do you make sure you don't focus on everything that could go wrong? Children being alive, the family being together. Um, and if you feel that anxiety, how do you make sure you don't share it with your family and you manage that? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take that. Are you going to ask the second one, or is that fine? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think, uh, for me, the most important thing is to accept who I am and to accept the present. And uh, to and, I, and as I said, I always try to stay positive and try to look at the, the good things in life, what I have. And after that, I, when I realized that I had lost hearing in my left ear, that I had uh, my facial nerve or the left side of my face was cut down and the movement of my left side of my face was affected. And then later on I did surgery and it improved and uh, that I realized that it can never go perfect again. And I realized that the things I had lost 
And I think it just reminded me of the things I had and the things I should be thankful for, for having a vision, to being able to hear, to being able to speak, and uh, to being able to be, to be thankful for what I have from things that I have personally in my body, but also to have family, to have friends, to be together with them, to enjoy each and every moment of my life. So I try to stay positive, but then there are hard times when you get nervous. I'm not like a completely perfect person <laughs> that every day is a happy day. Um, and hardships do come in life. There are moments when you hear things, uh, you hear bad comments from people, you hear, uh, you have exam stress, you have that anxiety, you are worried about your speech, your, uh, what you are going to say tomorrow, how things are going to happen, whether you are on the right path, whether you need to do something more in life. So we all go through these difficulties, these challenges in our life, but I think the best thing is to be patient and to give yourself time, don't be in any hurry, don't, don't stress yourself, to give yourself time, and that's what I did. I give myself time, and I said, focus on your studies, uh, do the work that you can right now in your school's study time, stay focused on, on yourself, build up yourself, learn, and live a normal life as a student, as a girl, and uh, so that's what I did, and that's how I made sure I recover in a very positive and safe way. Hi, my question is for Cheryl about teaching kids resilience. I think sometimes as a parent, you have a desire to protect your kids and shield them from heartache, but you also, I think as a parent, have a responsibility to teach them to be resilient. So how do you find that balance? And um, yeah, how, how, do you have any advice oh, for that? We've studied this extensively. I'm gonna let Adam answer this question. We've already read a chapter about this in our book. <laughs> there's, there's a great book by uh, Julie Lithgott Hames called How to Raise an Adult which is all about this. And it says, the first thing you have to do is normalize struggle. You cannot protect your children from all struggle, right? They will have challenges, whether they fail an exam or they you know, don't make the, the football team or you know, they forget their lines in a school play. And I think that you have to show them that that is okay, right? That's normal, that happens to you. And that means l letting them see you struggle too. The other thing we found from the research on raising resilient kids is kids have to know that they matter. And mattering is just a belief that, that other people notice you, care about you, and rely on you. And I think as parents, I know as a parent, I, I know the first two pieces of that. Are, they're really clear. You know, pay attention to your kids, right? Show that you love them, check. But we forget that kids also need to feel relied on and depended on, that other people count on them, and that's part of what signals to them, look, I have confidence in you, right? I believe you have strength. And so I think one thing that we can all do, those of us who have kids, is when you face a big challenge, you go to your kids and you ask them for advice. What would you do in this situation? And it teaches them that they're trusted to deal with it, and then it also lets them practice the coping skills that they're going to need once they do face hardship. Um, this is for Cheryl. Um, what has been one of your biggest challenges being CEO of Facebook? What was the question? I think we applaud for the question, first of all. Woo! Adam, did you hear it? For those who couldn't hear, the question was, uh, Cheryl, what's been one of your biggest challenges as COO of Facebook? Well, I just want to thank you for making my night and leaning in and asking a question. How old are you? How old are you? I'm 10. Yay! <laughs> wow. Well, I think we all look forward to what you're going to do. Um, the challenges have changed. I think the first and most important challenge when I showed up is um, trying to figure out how to scale the company and how to have a business model. So when I first showed up at Facebook, um, we were very good at connecting people and helping them share but we weren't so good at making the money that would pay to connect people and help them share. And it turns out that for a business, that's an un unsustainable place to be. But we do that very well now, often led by great women. Nicola Mendelssohn's here, Nicola, stand up. Nicola runs EMEA for Facebook, and she is incredible. <laughs> and so, one of the ways I met that challenge is I just found fantastic people around the world to hire and gave them the opportunity to do what they do. 
If we have any other girls in the audience who want to demonstrate their executive leadership skills, <laughs> now would be a great Now's your time. time. We'll take anyone, Let's any of those questions. Here. Hi, first of all, thank you so much for coming over to England and speaking. Um, my question is a bit explicit, but um, in the current global social climate, where the self-styled leader of the free world, the President of the United States, advocates grabbing women by the pussy, how can we look children in the eyes and say that sexual and psychological violence against women isn't legitimized? There's no place for violence against women and there's, there's no place of any kind. Unfortunately, violence against boys, girls, men, women has been uh, part of every culture. It remains part of every culture. There is against both genders, there is more against women. And it is uh, completely unacceptable. And we know that. And um, we know that as we think about how we raise our sons, how we raise our daughters, and how we make sure there's no tolerance for that behavior, you know, of any kind. I think people worry about what's happening to girls on college campuses. They should be worried about that. People worry about what happens to kids in families when they're on the street. And silence is the enemy of all of this. For, for many, many, literally hundreds of years, this stuff always happened and wasn't talked about. And we need to shine a bright spotlight on it and make sure we don't teach it and we don't tolerate it. Always. And, yeah. and I'll just um, add one thing to that. And I think I've always been really worried and really careful about this is that we should not harm anyone, whether that is harming them physically or harming them mentally, we should not harm anyone. And I think that's the biggest mistake or the, the, the wrong thing or the wrong deed or the sin or any, anything we call it that is ever we can do is harm another person, is harm their feelings, is hurt them. Is, and I think that's something we should always avoid in our life if we want to be responsible people, if you want to be good people, that you need to take care of other people. And I, and I think it's our social responsibility. It is, it is our responsibility as individuals as well that we make sure that we do not cause any pain, any harm in, in anyone's life. So make sure that before you comment, before you say anything, you're taking care of people, you're thinking about their feelings and their emotions, and uh, just consider those people as yourself, be in their position and think about them, how, how you would feel if you were instead of them. So it's important that we care for others, that we count them as equal to ourselves, and that we know that if someone had harmed us, how we would have felt. So let's avoid any harm, any pain for others, and, and know that it's your responsibility not to harm, because sometimes we just don't care, and I think it's important. Um, and like, it's so shocking that people on leadership skills, you want them to be role models, you want them to be running countries, if you hear these hateful comments, if you hear these uh, comments that are gender biased, that are, um, Sexist, this is, this is really, really harmful for society. You're telling people it's okay to be sexist, it's okay to be racist, it's okay to harm people, whether that's through your bad comment or whether that's physically, that you're telling the people it's okay, but it's not okay. We have to be careful, we have to be responsible, and we have to make sure that we realize that we are living in a civilized society, we are human beings, and we have this sense of of being nice to each other, and we have this sense that we should not harm others. We're gonna go over here next. I just wanna add quickly, I think this is one of the reasons we need more women leaders. Um, the data are very clear across countries that when we have women in politics and leadership roles, um, we actually see more peace. And I think it's a, it's a travesty that I've done this for years with students. I've asked them to name who are the leaders that you admire most? Who are your role models? Over a thousand answers, only two women have been named. Um, and those two women are actually Malala and Cheryl. <laughs> but. Um, but 
But that's a problem. It's a huge problem. I mean, problem. that's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. And I think that, you know, we have lots of women who name male leaders as role models. We need to be able to say, look, as a man, these are two of my role models, and they are both women. And that's something we should all look up to. Over here. This is, oh, this, this is, is Carol. Carol. Um, how did you help your children you through the strong, through the hard times? How did I help my children be strong with hard times? Well, thank you guys for leading in and answer, asking a question. Um, well, when my kids, you know, we lost, they lost their father suddenly. My children were seven and 10, uh, which is something I never expected to happen. And uh, flying home to tell my children that their father was gone. There were a lot of very terrible moments in this whole thing, but that might have been the worst. And I remember Adam telling me that they were going to get through it, that they were. They were going to get through it. And they did. And they still miss him. I still miss him. But even my kids have grown from this horrific experience. I, again, I would take that growth away from them and give them back their father, but I can't. But in a sure sign of post-traumatic growth, my son's basketball team lost the playoffs. And all the other little boys were crying. And I looked at my son, and he looked fine. And I said, are you OK? And he rolled his eyes, and he said, Mom, this is sixth grade basketball. <laughs> he said, I'm fine. And I was talking with these amazing uh, young men and women at Drive Forward, the hard things in our life, we would not choose them, but they make us stronger. My son has been through a lot, and he knows he can go through a lot. And I wouldn't wish that on any of us, but when the hard moments happen, finding the strength within us to get through them. And I hope for the two of you, nothing really bad happens, but if you don't do as well as you need to on a test or want to, or someone takes your seat in the lunch line, I hope those are the worst adversities you face. But I think even in those, you realize you get through it and you get stronger. We do. That's resilience. Uh, Cheryl, you talked about destroying stereotypes in, in, in a family setting, but let's face it, a lot of the people in charge of policy are coming in with a sexist mindset. How do we change their mindsets, which are so deeply ingrained so that we can get effective change now? We argue for the public policies we need. We get more women elected, absolutely. So if you're sitting here and you think you might want to run for office, run. And if you're sitting here and you think you might not, run anyway if you're a woman. And those three young girls who asked a question, all three of you, for sure. But we need to get more women elected. We need to get more women running companies. When women run companies, those companies have better family-friendly policies. You know, when we experience loss, most people in the United States get very little leave, very little paid leave, and bereavement leave is something a lot of companies don't really focus on. After I lost Dave, we changed Facebook bereavement leave. It was pretty good before, it was 10 days, and now it's 20. And other companies are starting to follow suit. More women, I think, mourning more companies, and then making the case that how our society treats the people who need the more help, most help, how our companies treat our employees, how we treat each other makes us stronger. Make the case that this is not just the right thing to do, but the smart thing to do. Who stands by you and gives you hope in the darkest corners? I think that's for you. Sorry, can you, can you repeat the question? Yeah. Who stands by you and gives you hope in the darkest corners? Did you hear? Who stands by you and gives you hope in your darkest corners? Um, my parents and um, I think also the people who have supported me and I think there is a lot to celebrate and there's a lot, there are a lot of people who can help you and support you. We just need to think for a second and appreciate who we have. So definitely my friends and my family. And I think we're about time in terms of wrap up. Uh, I do want to give you each a chance to give a final word. And there is this lovely family tradition um, in Cheryl's house of asking for a best, worst, and most grateful moment of the day. And it would be wonderful to hear each of yours. 
Um, I think worst I would say is that I'm just still thinking about my exams. <laughs> uh, still thinking about all the mistakes that I think I have made and that I think I'm going to get D's and E grades. Uh, she never gets those. No, I do. <laughs> and then this, I think the best thing is meeting you all, talking to you all, and then uh, sharing our feelings, sharing our thoughts, and, um, and I think just coming together, I think this is one of the best moments. And what was the third one? Great. Got it, best words, yeah. grateful. Okay. Um, my best moment of the day is being here with the, just this unbelievable woman who, you know, is not just the youngest Nobel Peace Prize winner, but is a symbol of peace and hope for me and so many others around the world, and my dearest friend, Adam. My worst, we always say this, is my house is always the same, it's losing Dave. And I'm grateful for what I learned today from Martha and the unbelievable young men and women at Drive Forward. You taught me and showed me what resilience and collective resilience can look like today. And it's a lesson I will take with me for the rest of my life. So I'm grateful to you. In closing, I want to say first, thanks to Intelligence Squared for hosting an incredible event. We're grateful for that. Thank you. <laughs> Secondly, thanks to all of you in the audience for coming and giving us the chance to share today. We really appreciate that. And then finally, thanks to the two leaders I admire most for inspiring so many of us.